Well, hello everyone. It's a real joy to be back with you again as we study this book of Genesis. Like so many things, uh, even I as a teacher am experiencing this word anew. I was listening uh, this week to a presentation I gave on these chapters in 2005. And many things I said in that presentation I had completely forgotten. And I thought, wow, I'm, I'm learning this new. Wow, I never made that connection before. And yet I had made the connection before. But it's just lost somewhere in the cobwebs of my mind. So it just reinforced me the great wisdom of the church that we're on these lectionary cycles where we hear the word again and again and again because we can lose some of our understanding. And by continually coming back to the word, it really renews its power and presence in our own life. So I'm really grateful for this experience to to go through this study with you. Uh, Let's begin, as always, um, with the word of prayer. Prayer is the thing that, of course, uh, unites us to Christ and unites this service we're offering him and this gift that he's offering us in his word. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Father God, thank you for the glory of this beautiful, sunny winter day. Uh, Thank you for the moisture that you brought us recently. We pray for more, especially for our farmers and ranchers, all those who depend so deeply upon um, water in our area. We thank you for that great gift. We thank you for the gift of your word, for giving us Father Abraham, Mother Sarah, even in their failings, even in their faltering. Uh, We take courage uh, that you work with dented cans, you work with uh, broken vessels to accomplish your purposes, that your covenant rests on your faithfulness, not our sometimes flagging faith. And so uh, thank you for giving us the realism of the lives of these patriarchs um, to, again, encourage us in our walk with you, that you want us to keep coming back to you even in our brokenness. We ask that your Holy Spirit that gave us this word that spoke it so long ago will awaken our hearts and minds to hear from this word, that wisdom that we need now in our lives. And we ask for that same Holy Spirit to to open up our hearts, to soften our hearts, to be more docile to the promptings of grace in our life and your continual offers of covenant love and life. We ask all this through the powerful name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. In the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Well, just to connect what we're going to be exploring today with what we're going to be looking at uh, in these coming chapters, there's a great commentary by uh, Kenneth Matthews on uh, Genesis 1 through 11. It's over 500 pages in length. And uh, he teaches Old Testament uh, and Hebrew exegesis in Birmingham. He wrote also wrote commentaries on uh, Leviticus and uh, on Joshua. Anyway, uh, he said that Genesis 11, that's the story of the Tower of Babel, mirrors the attempts of humanity in the garden to achieve power and position independently of God. The attempt of the Babelites to transgress human limits is reminiscent of Eve's ambition. As in the Tower story, the divine plural also appears in the garden account. Both indicate the divine distress over the potential havoc that the new knowledge achieved by mankind may bring about. And so there's always these links, these echoes, these repetitions in these stories that we've seen already from the first fall to the kind of mini fall that happens in the Tower of Babel. And so we're moving from that kind of literature, that primeval literature, theological history, you could say, into the next part of the book of Genesis. So you remember we looked at in our opening lecture that there's two major parts. The primeval period is chapters 1 through 11. The patriarchal period is chapters 12 through 50. And so we're shifting now to that period. What you see on the screen is a selection from the Great Adventure Bible Timeline, which I taught and work with um, with audiences all over the world. And it's just a nice little um, pamphlet that tucks in the back of your Bible that kind of gives us the big picture of the story. If you don't have a timeline, I'd really encourage you to get one. You can order a timeline. They're five or six dollars from uh, Our Lady's Catholic Bookstore or go to Ascension Press online and you can pick one up. It tucks neatly in the back of your Bible and gives you the big picture of everything from Genesis to Revelation. But you'll see kind of a movement there in the center from the primeval period, Genesis 1 through 11, down into the patriarchal period. That red fuzzy line is the kind of bloodline of Jesus. It's his ancestry. 
that we can trace through all the many genealogies that are mentioned. And you'll see in the period of the patriarchs, the famous patriarchs, uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And then we're going to be focusing on Joseph uh, in the lion's share, really, of this section, chapters 37 through 50. And there's a kind of division even within this larger division of 12 through 50. In the patriarchal period, there are um, three patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Uh, those chapters 12 through 36 form kind of what you would say are um, small episodic stories from the lives of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And then 37 through 50 is a single large narrative that serves as a kind of conclusion to the patriarchal age and is a prequel to the book of Exodus. Because the end of Genesis answers the question, how did Abraham's descendants end up in Egypt when God had given them the region that we call the promised land? So Joseph narrative completes the patriarchal period and then provides a prelude to the period of the Exodus. Uh, there's also some kind of interesting links between what we just left and what we're going into. That you remember at the Tower of Babel, they wanted to build that great edifice to do what? To make a name for ourselves versus God's promise that we'll see to Abram that God will make his name great. So it's that idea of being in a place of receptivity versus a place of grasping. Uh, instead of trying to make our name great ourselves, we're trusting God to do that great work in our life. Remember, we mentioned that language of we don't take communion, we receive communion. But the human person is continually trying to make a name for itself, right? We still put names on monuments uh, even today. And we've also talked about how the Toledos, the genealogies, give us a kind of measurement between the important narratives in the book of Genesis. And oftentimes those Toledotes, those genealogies, give us clues for what's coming next. They either give us key themes or they give us key persons. So, of course, in this one, our clues are the upcoming figures. So in the end of chapter 11, verse 27, Abram is introduced as the son of Terah. Uh, verse 29, Sarai is introduced. So those are our two major characters coming up. And then in verse 30, you also have this language of uh, that Sarai is barren and has no child. So we have a story that begins with barrenness, but ends in blessing. So God is going to choose Abraham, Abraham at age 75, Sarai at age 65. They're the most unlikely couple to begin a new covenant family of God especially given that it's going to be 25 more years, even before Isaac is born. But that's the model of God. He begins with barrenness and he brings blessing and fruitfulness. Again, think back to creation. Tohu va bohu. He begins with nothing. He begins with the void. And into that, he speaks blessing. Into that, he speaks fruitfulness. The other great theme you're going to see through the Abrahamic cycle is a kind of faith trajectory for Abram and Sarai, later Abraham and Sarah. And it's this movement from fear to faith. Faith is given as a grace, of course, just as it is for us, but it has to be cooperated with. We have to exercise that faith. And many times Abraham and Sarai, Abram and Sarai, are going to act out of fear rather than faith. So we're going to see through these succeeding chapters their faith mature. So tonight we're going to look at part one of the Abrahamic cycle, chapters 12 through 17, and then this cycle will end in chapter 25, which is where Abraham dies. And so we see uh, throughout this these cycles of the Abrahamic narrative, God is going to come and visit Abraham seven times. Remember, seven is a number of covenant. Each of those seven visits is an invitation to enter the plans and purposes of God. So they're going to unfold from uh, chapters 12 through 22. Uh, Sheva, the Hebrew word for seven, remember, means oath. So it's a number of covenant and it's a number of perfection. It's a number of completion. And each of these encounters is drawing Abram deeper and deeper into the heart and the plans of God. And as I mentioned before, sometimes he's going to respond with faith and sometimes he's going to act out of fear. The Jewish people, by the way, also have uh, Abraham 
not only having these seven visits, but undergoing 10 different tests from the Lord. And you remember that 10 is also an important number in the Hebrew scriptures. Uh, 10 times in Genesis chapter 1, it uses the phrase, and God said. We've seen that there are 10 toledotes that help us shape the narrative of Genesis. Of course, we have the 10 commandments. So 10 is also a number of divine perfection. And so it shouldn't surprise us that there are 10 visits to Abraham. Now, what's interesting is not all 10 of, not 10 visits, but 10 tests, seven visits, 10 tests. Not all of these 10 visits are found in the scriptures themselves. Sometimes they're found in the Jewish uh, oral traditions. So let me give you uh, one example of that. Um, one of the oldest cities in the world is the city of Ur of Chaldees. Uh, it's been the site of, on and off again, many archaeological digs. Uh, this is where Abraham begins, and this is where the first test of Abraham happens in Jewish tradition. Uh, that city of Ur, remnants of that ancient city Ur of the Chaldees, still exist today. Much of it was sadly destroyed by us uh, during the first Gulf War, but as late as 2016, there was ongoing excavations there. It's still not very safe for people to go there, but there is some excavating still going on. Uh, this ancient city that's mentioned uh, connected to Abraham, they found over 35,000 artifacts, over 2,000 tombs. Uh, this work began clear back in the 1920s, many different temples. And at the time of Abraham, we're looking at about 2,000 years or so before Christ, uh, it was believed by archaeologists to have about 60,000 people in this city. Uh, I'll just show you one kind of artifact just to give you a sense of the, the beauty of what they were creating. It's a um, bull, a bearded bull, probably one of the gods of the uh, Chaldeans, just like the Egyptians had a bull god, and that's connected to the golden calf, by the way. And uh, it's made there, you can see that beard of lapis lazuli, um, so it's very, very valuable. It was a lyre or a harp that was played. And that dates to around 2600 BC. So about 500 or so years before Abraham. So you can see it was a very developed and extraordinary culture. Ur of the Chaldees is, as I mentioned, in modern day Iraq. It's way down near uh, the Persian Gulf. And so on the map, you can see if you look over to the right-hand side, you can see Ur, just above the Persian Gulf. Abram's going to journey from there up to Haran, which is in modern-day Syria today. That's where we're going to meet him in the Bible text. And then from there, he's going to go down into Canaan. You can see that on your map. Around 1,500-mile journey. While he's in Cana, he's going to visit many cities that we'll see mentioned in the readings, like Bethel and Shechem. And what is also interesting is the route that we see Abraham take in the Bible is also the ancient trade routes. So what we know of ancient civilization, we know that those cities that he visits and that journey that he takes would have followed very known trade routes of his time. And it's in the city of Ur in Jewish tradition that God first appears to Abram. So remember in our text in uh, Genesis chapter 12, He's already in Haran. He's already in Syria when the Lord speaks to him there. But God in Jewish tradition first reveals to Abraham himself in the city of Ur. He confers to Abraham the truth that he alone, Yahweh, is God. And then it, the Jewish tradition goes on to tell us that Abram starts tearing down the images of all the pagan gods in the city. And as a punishment, he's thrown into a furnace not unlike the, the young men in Daniel, but he survives. And so for the Jewish people, this is the first test that he passes. Now, what's interesting is, though that is preserved only in the Jewish oral tradition, which corresponds to our Catholic sacred tradition, you might say, it's not found in Genesis. But the New Testament authors are clearly aware that God first began speaking to Abram in Ur of the Chaldees, because Stephen, in his great sermon, in Acts chapter 7, mentions that specifically. So Genesis only gives us the account of God appearing or speaking to Abraham in Haran, in Syria, after they've left Ur. And these traditions of uh, kind of extra biblical details can be found in the Jewish Mishnah, in the Jewish Talmud, uh, etc. And 
Many of these stories have been collected in a seven volume series that I just want to commend to you if you're ever in a good Catholic or excuse me, a good used bookstore somewhere, look for uh, Lewis Ginsburg's uh, The Legend of the Jews. It was published in 1909, seven volumes in this series, and you get a lot of really interesting anecdotes from the rabbis, Jewish Midrash, as I said, uh, the Jewish Mishnah and Talmud, their, their scriptural and uh, written down oral traditions, uh, give us a lot of these kind of details to flesh out stories. So for the Jews, when we get to Genesis 12, which is where we're going to begin today, that's the second test of the 10 tests. But it's the first of the seven visits that the book of Genesis wants to show us. Uh, because remember, those numbers are often qualitative. So what is the test in Genesis 12? Is he going to leave family? Is he going to leave home? Is he going to leave his comfort zone, the good life he has in Haran, to follow after God? And the good news is he passes the test. Now, you might remember I said in our introductory session that as children, uh, we are kind of given or we remember a kind of edited version of Abram and Sarai, later Abraham and Sarah. Uh, our memory kind of links onto those best moments. And we remember Abraham as the father of faith. But as I've mentioned already, and as you saw if you read through the text this week for your homework, uh, they both often uh, operate and act out of a place of fear. And I do like the idea that we remember biblical figures for their moments of greatest cooperation with God versus their lowest moments, that we remember Abraham as father of faith, not as failing Abraham. Uh, but I'm also reminded that my own namesake is monikered with his low point. So what do we call the apostle who didn't believe the other apostles that Jesus had risen from the dead, we call him Doubting Thomas. Even though he goes on to be a great saint, he goes on to be a martyr for the faith, he's forever connected to his lowest moment of faith, not his greatest moment of faith. Uh, so uh, I, I guess it's a pet peeve of mine. We don't call the head apostle betraying Peter, even though he betrays the Lord. We remember Peter as a pillar of the faith. And maybe reading these chapters, you were a little scandalized. Sometimes that happens when we see how many times Abram and Sarai falter in their faith. But on the whole, though they're broken, though sometimes they fail, uh, their faith is maturing. And Abraham ultimately is going to pass the greatest tests of faith offered to him. And of course, he figures prominently in our Catholic consciousness. So in this session, I just did just want to mention how many times we find Abram in our liturgies, in important parts of our faith. Uh, think about, for example, uh, the Liturgy of the Hours. Uh, the two great prayers that everyone who prays the Liturgy of the Hours, the, the four-volume set of prayers prayed by clergy, religious, and laity all over the world, every morning in the Liturgy of the Hours, you pray Zacharias Benedictus. Every evening, at evening prayer, you pray the Magnificat of the Blessed Virgin Mary. And both of these prayers are rooted in God's promises to Father Abraham. Abraham also has a feast day on our liturgical calendar, October 9th. Uh, in the Commendation for the Dying, it speaks about Abraham, our father in faith, and it includes this invocation, deliver your servant, Lord, as you delivered Abraham from Ur of the Chaldees. So that's in the commendation of the dying. At the rite of Christian burial, listen to the prayer that the priest prays. He says, Almighty Father, eternal God, hear our prayers for your son James, whom you've called from this life to yourself. Grant him light, happiness, and peace. Let him pass safely through the gates of death and live forever with all your saints. Now listen to this. In the light you promised Abraham and to his descendants in faith. And then later in the responsory that's sung uh, while the, the casket is usually sprinkled with holy water and incensed, the, the priest speaks words that address the soul in the casket or in the urn. May Christ who called you take you to himself. May angels lead you to Abraham's side. 
And by the way, that's also a prayer we can pray immediately after someone dies. It's found in the Book of Blessings, which include prayers that anyone can pray for another. And that's an extraordinarily beautiful one. May Christ who called you take you to himself. May angels lead you to Abram, Abraham's side. And of course, we've mentioned before how Abel um, and how other New Testament fig- or Old Testament figures are mentioned in the Mass. So in Eucharistic Prayer 1, remember that's the oldest prayer we have, around s- at least 1,700 years old. Uh, we hear language about two figures that we're going to meet this week, Abraham and Melchizedek. So be pleased to look upon our offerings with a serene and kindly countenance and to accept them as once you were pleased to accept the gifts of your servant Abel the just, the sacrifice of Abraham, our father in faith, and the offerings of your high priest Melchizedek, a holy sacrifice, a spotless victim. So Abraham is really kind of ubiquitous in our liturgical celebrations and in our devotional life as a church. Now, we're going to enter into uh, the story of Abraham. And again, we're shifting from primeval to patriarchal. And I mentioned early on that this does mean we can start matching up the events that we read about in the Bible with contemporary events happening in the world around the biblical story. So if you uh, look at all the kind of a notation, year notations mentioned in the Bible, we can safely kind of predict the birth date or or deduce, you could say, the birth date of Abraham as around 2100 years before Christ. Some say 2166. And that's reached by backtracking from numeric references that we find in, in Genesis, in Exodus, in 1 Kings, in addition to contemporary inscriptions of neighboring nations that mention kings of Israel. So that helps us kind of map the biblical story with other nations around them and actually set more strict dates. Uh, We have other records we found from civilizations at this time that match up with some of the actions of Abraham. For example, uh, taking your wife's handmaid as a wife if your wife is barren. That's something that was practiced in the time of Abraham. Uh, Possessing household gods as a sign of your birthright inheritance, something that we see in Genesis chapter 31 was prevalent in this period of time in the surrounding culture. And there's other cultural connections that were found in the 1920s in northeastern Iraq in in a collection that's called the Nuzi collection, N-U-Z-I. And it was inscriptions, tablets of different legal um, prescriptions for that time, things that were permitted. And we see that language mirrored in the story of Abraham, further confirming the historicity and the historic placement of Abraham, uh, again, around 2,100 years or so before Christ. Nuzi, by the way, is the name of the small town that was excavated in that area in northeastern uh, Iraq. So uh, what we're going to read now in Genesis chapter 12 is the beginning of the promises of God to Abraham. And in your Bible timeline, you'll see there on the screen, even if you don't have it, if you look at that red box, those are the major parts of this language that God is going to use with Abraham. It's called the Abrahamic covenant. There's three major themes within the covenant, the promise of a land, the promise of a kingdom, and the promise to be a worldwide blessing. You'll see those parts of the promises reaffirmed in stronger covenant language Later, we'll see that in chapter 15 and chapter 17. And then finally, we'll see it in next lesson in chapter 22. And those three themes are also connected to later covenants. So the theme regarding the land is going to be connected to language and covenant God makes with Moses. The kingdom promises are going to be connected to covenant language with David. And of course, the new and everlasting covenant of Jesus Christ is going to be connected to Abraham's seed bringing about a worldwide blessing uh, to um, all the nations of the earth. So what is the challenge of Abram? What's his uh, second test? Is he willing to leave all of the sources of his security, his comfort zone? And that's what we read in the opening verses of Genesis chapter 12. And this moment is actually celebrated in Hebrews 11. That's the hall of faith. And in the Hall of Faith, naming all the great Old Testament figures, it puts a special emphasis on Abraham's faith. 
It says in Hebrews 11, by faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go to a place which he was to receive as an inheritance. That's the promised land. And he went out not knowing where he was to go. So he's the model for us. And he's even the model of Hebrew 11's definition of faith. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not yet seen. He's called to go someplace he, he doesn't even know where it is. Every step then is a step of faith. Every moment of Abraham is placing his trust in God uh, to go to a place that he's never seen before. And if you look closely at that blessing, it has seven parts, seven parts. Remember the number seven is our covenant number again. Uh, you're welcome to write this in your Bible, maybe with a pencil or however you like to mark your scriptures. Uh, I once had a Catholic tell, tell me that a priest told her it was a mortal sin to write in your Bible. Don't believe that. Uh, I just remind Catholics that someone's already, so to speak, written in your Bible because chapters and verses weren't put in until just really a few hundred years ago. So someone's already written in your Bible. Someone's put footnotes in your Bible and commentary in your Bible. So there's no problem with you writing insights in the margins or marking things in your Bible. In fact, it's very, very helpful. So what are the seven parts of the blessing to Abraham given here? The parts of this promise? Number one, I will make of you a great nation. Number two, I will bless you. Number three, I will make your name great. Number four, so you will be a blessing. Number five, I will bless those who bless you. We're now, in, now into verse three. Uh, I will curse those who curse you. That's number six. And then number seven, by you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So it's Jewish commentators that show us this seven-part pattern to these promises of God in the opening verses of Genesis chapter 12. And as I've already mentioned, there's those three major themes within that seven-part blessing connecting us to the, the major covenants that are to come. Now, Abram goes out and he brings with him his nephew Lot. Now, is that a problem? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a problem. In fact, that's going to bring a lot of problems, no pun intended. Look at the specific instructions of the Lord. Leave your what? Your kindred. Leave your family behind. And so we see whenever someone isn't wholly and completely obedient to the commands of God, it's always going to lead to later problems. And bringing Lot, his nephew, along is going to bring division. It's going to bring war. It's going to bring misery. It's going to bring death. It's going to bring immorality into the narrative. So we get that little clue about Abraham. He's passing the test, you might say, but he's not passing with flying colors. You might say he gets a, he gets a C plus on passing this test. Also note in this section his age, mentioned in verse 4. And I would write that off in the margin. It's really good because you can see how long the Abraham narrative goes. Uh, he's 75 years old. We know from later texts that Sarah is 10 years younger than him. So she would be 65 years old when they set out on this a great journey of faith. And as we mentioned already, he's up in Haran when he receives these promises from the Lord. And just follow that line down from Haran to the way of the sea. It's called the Via Maris. That path is still there today. All the way down to the city of Shechem. So you see Shechem down in Canaan. Canaan is what we would call today the promised land. It's called Shechem because it sits between two mountains that look like shoulder blades. So this is the city of Shechem today. And you can see those two sides of the mountain. Uh, it's a very important place later in the narrative because it's where Joshua will have the people uh, enter a covenant of faith with God's people. And it's this language that he uses from Joshua 24, kind of using these two mountains as symbols, those who are going to follow the Lord and those who are going to follow another path. That's where Joshua says, uh, as for me and my house, I will serve the Lord, or my family is going to serve the Lord. So th this is going to become a very important city later on. Now, also in Shechem, I just want to take note of this because people often mention it. Uh, it's a very ancient city, and one of the things that you'll also find there 
or you won't find that there today. But what was there anciently was what in the text is called the Oaks of, or the Oak of More, the Oak of More, or sometimes your Bible will see, say the Terebinth tree. So what does Abraham say when he sees the Oak of More? He says, that's some more. No, he doesn't say that. <laughs> but the Lord does visit him there and he builds an altar there. Now, why is this important? Because these oaks, like the Oak of More and the Oak of Mamre that we're going to see later, were Canaanite altars of worship. They're places of polytheistic worship. And the mention in this text here that this is the place of the Canaanites should cause red flags. Because remember what you learned about Ham and the curse of Canaan in the story of Noah, that they need to beware of the Canaanites. They, these, these oak trees that would just be located in remote places were often symbols of life, symbols of fertility. So it's here that Canaanites would undergo cultic acts of a sexual nature that they would perform here. They believe that you could provoke uh, the god of fertility to act by engaging in sexual acts in these places. And so what is Abram going to do? He's going to build an altar to the one true God, Yahweh, in this place as a kind of countersign. Remember that Jewish oral tradition of him being in Ur. He's going to tear down the old pagan gods, and he's going to promote the belief in the one true God. Jesus does something like this. Maybe we can look at this more. We talked about it in our Matthew study, that what we call the Mount of Transfiguration or the Mount Tabor was called the throne of Baal, B-A-A-L, one of the Canaanite gods. And so it's not accidental that God goes there and reveals his divinity. He's going to places of darkness and he's planting his light in that place. He's taking back that place for the Lord. So when you're reading through the Old Testament, you're going to come across these. Sometimes they're going to be called high places. Sometimes they are a pole, like an Ashtara pole, which is carved from one of these trees, likely like a kind of totem or a kind of sexual symbol. So Abram's going to go to these places of pagan worship, and he's going to build an altar to the one true God, a kind of memorial in these places. Now he's going to go from there down to the Negev. That's the region of the Dead Sea. It's pretty desolate if you journey very far from the Jordan River, which you can see that drains into the Salt Sea or the Dead Sea. This is the region in the very south of Sodom and Gomorrah, cities we're going to see later. Uh, and there's still kind of remnants of something dramatic that happened in that region. There's so much, um, uh, I don't know if it's sulfur or chemical content in where we think Sodom and Gomorrah was today, that uh, when I was there, a guy just scraped some of the rocks and took his scrapings and put them in a pile and then just threw a match on them and it just ignited into a purple flame. It's where we get the term a fire and brimstone from. Is from the chemical content of that region. So that's not specifically where Abram is right now, but he's in that general area, which is either very fertile near the Jordan River or very desolate, uh, as we see now, down around the Dead Sea and where Sodom and Gomorrah used to be. But from every indication, Sodom and Gomorrah was at one time, a very beautiful place. Now, Abram is going to leave Negev in verse 10, and he's going to go into where? He's going to go into Egypt. Why? Because there's a famine. Now, this is a, a kind of test, isn't it? Will he trust God? If God leads me to this place, is he going to provide for me in this place? And he doesn't seem to trust. So in the famine, he ends up leaving the place of promise, the land of Canaan, and he goes down to a, another place. He goes down into Egypt, and that's going to lead to a whole series of problems. Remember, these little choices bring real consequences. And Abram going into Egypt is a prefigurement of the whole Exodus narrative that's going to happen at the end of Genesis. Why does the family of Jacob or Israel go to Egypt later in Genesis? Because of a famine. And what happens when they get down into Egypt? They have a conflict with the pharaohs, just like Abram is going to have a conflict with a pharaoh. Uh, both Abram and the Exodus bring a curse upon the house of Pharaoh. And you would have read about that this week. Or in the Exodus story, of course, it's the plagues, especially the last plague brings a curse down upon the house of Pharaoh. And finally, both will actually leave Egypt richer than when they went into Egypt. So 
uh, even God is faithful <laughs> to provide for them, even in their silliness and their mistakes. So Abram's going to come out with many resources. You'll see this in chapter 12, verse 16. And of course, in the Exodus narrative, in also in chapter 12, uh, verse 35 and following, you'll see that the wealth of Egypt goes out with the Hebrew people when they escape. And of course, both of them journey back to the promised land. So the Abram story here is a kind of mini exodus. But as I mentioned, it's also a test of faith. He doesn't trust the Lord, and that ends up compounding the sin. He starts to act out of fear. Uh, he looks at his wife, Sarai, and she must have been a sexy senior at 65, and he thinks men will see her beauty, and they will take her, and they will kill me. So what does he do? He conspires with Sarai to present herself as his sister. Now, technically, she's his half-sister, but he withheld a very important truth. She's married to him. That's a classic sin of omission. So God forbid, if they do want her, he imagines, at least I won't be killed in the process. So how is Abraham's wife or Abram's wife being treated? She's being objectified by Abram. By a fallacious, the end justifies the means action. That to preserve my life, I'm going to undergo deceit and I'm going to engage my sister in deceit. By the way, think about that language again. They will see her beauty. It's the same Hebrew word tov for the deliciousness of the fruit on the tree. And they will do what? They will take her. So there's that pattern of seeing something good, seeing something beautiful, seeing something delicious, not respecting boundaries and norms given by God, and then taking on our own terms. He maybe has a sense that that's human nature, but instead of trusting the word of God to protect him, to not fear, that's the language in the beginning of Genesis 12, he instead acts out of fear. And then, of course, this brings out a lot of problems in the text. Uh, and a lot of conflict that involves Sarai in this sin, and then eventually they escape that. Now they're going to come back to uh, the land of Canaan and back to uh, Lot to see what's going on there. Now we don't have time to go verse by verse, so let me hit the most important stories in these remaining chapters. Uh, Abram and Lot are going to separate. Note how Lot also follows the same sin pattern of where he's going to settle his people and separate from Abram. He sees the land that looks the best, that's the most beautiful, and he does what? He takes it. And that's going to lead to many problems because there's going to be, there are going to be peoples, kings, and nations living in those lands. So following the separation, Lot leaves the land of promise. He's going to settle in Sodom. Abram moves from Bethel, which means house of God, to Hebron. So he's just about 20 miles south of modern-day Jerusalem today. And there the Lord reaffirms to Abram the land promise from Genesis 12 and gives a kind of map of its boundaries. And it's in this section that you'll notice again an oak, the oak of Mamre, another place of worship there. Now, two things to mention about chapter 14. Like we saw earlier in Genesis, when someone follows that see and take model of sin, it always leads to more sin. It always leads to violence. We see this true for Lot. Remember, if Abram had just left Lot behind, like God told him to do in Genesis 12, we wouldn't have any of these problems. But Lot gets himself in trouble. He goes into battle with the locals. He loses. He becomes a prisoner of war. And eventually, Abram has to rescue him. But two important things I want you to not miss in this chapter. The first thing is that here it mentions that Abram is called the Hebrew, the Hebrew. That's the first time we have this term in the Bible. It's a term derivative of his ancestor Eber, E-B-E-R, who's mentioned in chapter 10, verse 21. That name Hebrew is going to become a name for the descendants of Abraham. They'll be called the Hebrews. You'll see this especially in uh, the book of Exodus. And of course, it's the name for the written, spoken, Semitic language. Even today, we call that language the Hebrew language. And this naming that we get here also answers another burning question. How does a Jewish man prepare his tea? He brews it. Sorry for all the Bible puns, but there's just too many here. 
So that's where the term Hebrews is first used. There's something else mentioned here that's important. And that's the introduction of this mysterious figure, Melchizedek. Now, Melchizedek in Hebrew means, uh, it's a title, probably a royal title. It means king of righteousness. And what do we learn about this figure, Melchizedek? He's priest of God Most High, El Eyon. In fact, he's the first person to be called a priest in the entire Bible. And what does he do? He offers bread and wine. He blesses Abram. Abraham, Abram ties his riches to this mysterious figure. That's 10% of all of his goods. And this figure is also the king of the city of Salem. Now, what is Salem today? Salem is the city of Jerusalem. Jerusalem just means the city of Salem. And you can see that connection, uh, for example, in Psalm 76 too, that Salem and Jerusalem are the same city. Salem, by the way, comes from the Hebrew term shalom, shalom, peace. So it's the city of peace. This, of course, is where David, not unlike Melchizedek, will become a king priest when he conquers Jerusalem and makes it his capital. St. Augustine will say that this scene here with Abram and Melchizedek is a prefigurement of the Eucharistic feast. So you've got a king priest, just like Jesus. You've got a bread and wine shared. You've got blessing being given and so on. So who is this Melchizedek? There are three kind of major theories. Number one, secular scholars will say that Melchizedek is simply a Canaanite king who's offering refreshments after the battle. That's it. Number two theory for who Melchizedek is, is that he is Shem. And so you may have noticed in the workbook, there are some quotes from Jewish texts that this mysterious figure of Melchizedek is actually the son of Noah, Shem. And if the genealogies can be believed, the aging of the people, then Shem would have not only been alive during the time of Abram, but will outlive Abram in age. So this would be interesting uh, if this was Shem. Uh, what's the argument here? Only someone greater than Abram could bless Abram. Uh, Abram would only offer tithes to someone probably like Shem, this very noble uh, ancestor of his, his. So as I mentioned, you can find this interpretation in a couple of Jewish texts. We've listed them in the workbook. Uh, but mostly in the Christian tradition, we associate a Jesus to Melchizedek, um, that he's a kind of a sign or prefigurement of Jesus Christ. And some even believe, and this is the third theory, this is a the theory that I, that I believe, I don't believe that Melchizedek is Shem, um, because, and I'll tell you why that theory doesn't bear out for me, even though it's in the workbook, it's because... Um, the person in charge of the content at that time, that was, that was the theory that person embraced, so it's there. And it's important that you know that theory. Um, but there are no Jewish writings that make this claim until after the introduction of Christianity into the world. And because Christians so heavily connect Jesus Christ to Melchizedek, there are many scholars that believe these later Jewish writings uh, focus on Melchizedek as Shem, to try to undermine that connection between Christ and Melchizedek. So the third theory is, is that Melchizedek is a Christophany. He's a pre-incarnation of God the Son. That is, he's Jesus, God the Son, appearing in the Old Testament. That's called a Christophany. You've heard of theophany before. That's an appearance of God. Christophany is when there's these kind of mysterious figures that appear in the Old Covenant, but that act uh, and speak very much like Jesus. The most famous example that we'll see later is the angel of the Lord, this mysterious figure who's a messenger of the Lord, that's what angel means, but always speaks as God himself first person. And that angel will interact with Old Testament figures as if he is God himself. So I tend to believe that Melchizedek is a kind of Christophany. It says that he has no genealogy, no parentage, uh, and that would also fit with the eternality of Christ as well. Um, so let me say this. There's a whole um, book of the Bible, the book of Hebrews in the New Testament, that's going to take up this connection between Melchizedek and 
uh, Jesus. Not the whole book of Hebrews, but you'll see it mentioned in Hebrews chapter 5, Hebrews chapter 6, and then the entirety of Hebrews chapter 7. Why? It's showing Jesus as the great high priest of the new and everlasting covenant, as a king priest like Melchizedek. His priesthood isn't tied to the Levitical priesthood. Jesus doesn't come through the tribe of Levi, the priestly tribe. He comes through the tribe of Judah. How then does he have a priesthood? He has a priesthood like Melchizedek of old, a priesthood that predates the Levitical priesthood. So the catechism takes this up in several places, the connection between Christ and Jesus, the connection between this ancient story and the Eucharistic feast. So let me just read to you two paragraphs from the catechism. The first is paragraph 1544. Everything that the priesthood of the old covenant prefigures finds its fulfillment in Christ Jesus, the one mediator between God and man. The Christian tradition considers Melchizedek priest of God most high as a prefiguration of the priesthood of Christ the unique high priest after the order of Melchizedek, holy, blameless, and unstained. By a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. That's language from our Mass, of course. That is, by the unique sacrifice of the cross. Then paragraph 1333. At the heart of the Eucharistic celebrations are the bread and wine that by the words of Christ and the invocation of the Holy Spirit become Christ's body and blood. Faithful to the Lord's command, the church continues to do in his memory and until his glorious return, what he did on the eve of his passion. That is, he took bread, he took the cup filled with wine. Uh, the signs of bread and wine become, in a way, surpassing our understanding, the body and blood of Christ. And they continue also to signify the goodness of creation. Thus, in the offertory, we give thanks to the Creator for bread and wine, fruit of the earth, and work of human hands, but above all, the gifts of the Creator. The church sees, here's the key phrase, the church sees in the gesture of the king priest Melchizedek, who brought out bread and wine, a prefiguring of her own offering. Now, the only other time that Melchizedek is mentioned in the Old Testament is Psalm 110. That's the messianic prophecy about a king priest to come. And you'll recognize the refrain there because it, we often pray this in the Mass. The psalm response for Psalm 110 is, You are a priest forever in the line of Melchizedek. That'll probably ring in your memory banks now. You are a priest forever in the line of Melchizedek. Do you remember that? Sorry, I can't sing very well. So that's a very important messianic psalm which is pre, uh, looking forward to a priest king to come, looking forward to the new covenant. And of course, we'll, we'll see this new covenant also spoken of in the prophets. So those are two key things to get out of chapter 14. Uh, Abraham is called uh, the Hebrew, and then you get that mysterious figure of uh, Melchizedek. Now, chapter 15 begins with a promise, fear not. Abraham, I am your shield. I am your protection. So it's mirroring the language of Genesis chapter 12. And if you look again at that chart, Genesis 15 is where God reaffirms the land promise. So we're going from a promise to a covenant enactment. And remember these themes of fear and faith. Uh, this is how we begin this chapter. Abram is tending to act in fear rather than faith. So God has to affirm uh, his commitment, his covenant commitment to Abram and affirm the language of the first promises that he gives him in Genesis chapter 12. Specifically here, the promise of land, although it begins with a query from Abram about when he's going to become a father. And interestingly, maybe we haven't even thought of this. We're already in chapter 15, and this, this is the first time that Abram speaks in the Bible. And what does he say? What are you going to give me? I continue to be childless. In the Hebrew language, it has a very kind of sarcastic tone. And so Abram, getting maybe impatient with Lord, proposes a solution. Maybe he says, God, we can uh, meet halfway. I've got this servant named Eleazar. Uh, he can act as an heir to me, and you can give all these promises and blessings you've, you've offered to me and give them to Eleazar. 
Now, that's another common legal practice that they found in those Newsy excavations from this period is that a servant could become the heir of a dynasty or of an inheritance if the a grantor wishes to give that to him or the grantor has no heir himself. But God rejects that plan B offer. And he uses an image that we are all very familiar with, doesn't he? Verse 5, he takes Abram outside and he says, Look to the heavens. Can you number the stars? So shall your descendants be. And then the text tells us that Abram believed the Lord and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. He, his faith puts him in good standing with the Lord. That's what that language means, to be reckoned as righteous. Abraham, though, then asks for assurance of the promise, uh, 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 a sign of this land possession, uh, if you can, you know. Uh, and this is, this is interesting that he still wants some kind of an assurance, something tangible, because maybe in his mind, Abram is saying, God has made me a lot of promises, but I'm not seeing anything concretely. Now, uh, here's another little clue to this text. I've got an image in front of you of Abram going out and looking to the heavens and God saying, can you number the stars? And maybe like you, I always grew up imagining that he's taking him out at night. But what's interesting about this chapter is it gives us uh, references of what time of the day later things happen. And later on in this same chapter, uh, the sun starts to set and then night comes. So... Here's something to consider. When God says, look to the heavens and if you can, number the stars, what if this happened at daytime? Why would that be significant for God to take Abram outside and say, look to the heavens and count the stars if you can? Can we see the stars in the middle of the day? No. You have to believe in what you cannot see. We know the stars are there because we've seen them before, but we have to kind of trust that, that our eyes aren't giving us the full data. Because of the brightness of the sun, we can't see the stars in the heavens. Remember that definition of faith. Faith, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not yet seen. So I think it makes the promise even more powerful if this encounter happened in the daytime because it's a beautiful picture of what so often happens with our faith. We have to believe beyond what we can see in our own vision. But even at night, it's a powerful promise. If you think that we can see 5,000 stars with the naked eye, that is still also a very visceral image for the Lord. But remember, Abram wants some kind of a sign, some kind of assurance. And so the Lord responds by commanding Abram to sacrifice a series of animals cut them in two, and create a path of blood between them. You can see that in the image there. It looks something like this. This was a common sign of covenant between peoples. It's called a self-maledictory oath. Maledictory means uh, evil, to bring evil upon yourself. It's where we get words like malad from, malad city, or um, uh, malady or sickness, or the Latin word malum, which is the word for evil. He, it's called a self-maledictory oath. That is, both parties typically are going to walk through the blood of that sacrifice, and they're making a visceral promise that may I receive a similar faith if I ever break faith with this covenant. Uh, it's the equivalent of us holding up our hand and saying, on my life, I'll pay you back that money. Or on my life, I'm keeping my promise. You're staking your life. But in the self-maledictory oath, whatever party walks through that blood is saying, may what happened to these animals happen to me if I break faith with you, if I break covenant with you. So these were very um, common oaths in this time. Remember the word covenant, berit, B-E-R-I-T, literally means to cut, to cut. And that's what's happening here. These, these sacrificial animals are being cut. The blood symbolizes their sharing in the surety of the covenant. And most often, the, only the lesser party in that relationship would walk through. The one 
least reliable would walk through the blood. If it was between a vassal and the king, the king wouldn't walk through the blood. The king stands on the power of his own office, but his vassal would walk through uh, the equivalent of offering his life. Now, what's interesting is what comes later. Remember I said you get little markers in the text. The sun begins to set. It becomes dark and Abraham uh, falls asleep. The Lord puts him into a deep sleep and he sees a vision. And what does he see? He sees a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch going through that path, that place where you're to take a self-maledictory oath. Note that Abram doesn't walk that bloody path. But what do those signs symbolize? The, the smoke and the fire, anytime you find those in the Bible, are signs of the presence of God. You'll see this in Exodus 4, Exodus 19. What leads the children of Israel through the wilderness? A pillar of smoke by day and a pillar of fire by night. Uh, there, it's a protecting presence of the Lord. So who is taking the self-maledictory oath? God himself. God is willing to take upon himself the curse of the covenant if either party breaks faith. God is the sole surety. God is the sole guarantor of this covenant. It was God's way of saying to Abraham, you have nothing to fear. Only have faith in our covenant relationship. I'm taking the whole burden of faithfulness upon myself. And if it hasn't already, that should call to mind Jesus Christ. Because in, in a sense, that is what Jesus does on the cross. Galatians chapter 3 verse 13 says, Christ has redeemed us from what? The curse of the law. Having become a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. All the disobedience to the commandments of God, Jesus takes that upon himself. He's entered into covenant with us. He will not break covenant with us. But he's willing to give everything to redeem us from the curse of the law. And this applies not only to the old covenant, but to all of us. Because Paul goes on in Galatians 3.29 to say, If you are Christ's, if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and you are heirs according to the promise. God is willing to give his own life in the person of Jesus Christ to take upon himself all of the violations to covenant faithfulness through all time. He is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world for all people for all time. So many Bible scholars think the cross is a kind of self-maledictory act where Christ takes the burden of covenant unfaithfulness upon himself. Gosh, so much here, and I'm trying to keep this to an hour. I've only got a couple minutes left. Let's touch on uh, the, the remaining sections of this text. The next episode you see is a fear, not faith response to the promises of God. Even right after God says, don't fear, even right after God makes his self-maledictory oath, they seem to fall back into a pattern of fear. Now, maybe Abram and Sarai have reasoned that, hey, God only promised Abram a son, he didn't say anything about Sarah being the mother, so let's try to help God out a little bit. Let's create a plan B for God. He doesn't seem to be fulfilling his promises. So what does Sarah, Sarai do? She offers her Egyptian handmaid, Hagar, to Abram. Now, where in the world did they get an Egyptian handmaid? Well, when they were down in Egypt. And remember, going down in Egypt was an act of fear, not faith. So here again, we see the compounding consequences of disobedience. Sarai offers to Abraham, and he listens to her, and he takes. What does that sound like? Someone listening to their wife, and then taking, and that, then that leads to tragedy. It's the original sin, again. Now, in spite of this, husbands listening, always listen to your wife. This is not a justification not to listen to her. But in these narratives, you'll see this pattern. Eve spoke to uh, Adam, and he listened, and he took. Sarai offers to Abraham, he listens, and he takes. So this is a kind of mini fall. Remember what the Catechism says, all subsequent sin is going to follow that original sin pattern. And what do they believe again? They believe this lie that was there in the very beginning, that somehow God is withholding a good from them. 
And so because God is withholding it, they have to take it on their own terms. What does Sarai say? The Lord prevented me from conceiving. He's withholding the power of conception from me for me. So they see Hagar as what? As nothing but an object to be taken, like the fruit. And rather than respect the boundaries, rather than trust in the word of God, they take Hagar on their own terms. They don't wait for the promises of God to be fulfilled. They take. And as expected, it's going to be disastrous. Sarai, once Hagar conceives, believes Hagar is looking on her with contempt Abraham, rather than protecting Hagar, hands her over to Sarai. And it says in the text that Sarai deals with her harshly, or some versions will say Sarai began to oppress Hagar, the Egyptian. Now keep that in mind because that's going to come up later. How old is Abram here? He's 85 years old now. Sarai, 75 years old. And so Abram and Sarai do what we do so often. They don't wait on the Lord. They don't fully trust in God. They try to play God. They try to manipulate circumstances. They try to help God out. That always ends in disaster. I think we all know that in our personal lives. Now, even though Abram and Sarai sinned, caused this big problem, Hagar is still loved and cared for by the Lord. So I love this narrative, and we're going to see it again later that the angel of the Lord comes to her. Remember I mentioned that the church fathers often associate this angel of the Lord with a Christophany, with Jesus appearing in the Old Testament. And here you see that tenderness that we see in the Gospel of John with Jesus and women who have been outcast. Uh, What does this angel of the Lord do? He encourages her. He tells her to return to Abram and Sarai. He gives her wonderful promises as well as the name of her son, which is Ishmael. Ishmael means God listened to Hagar's, we presume, cries for help. So see how this listening, God listening to Hagar's cry in the wilderness, overturns the sinful listening by Abram. So Hagar returns. She's received, it seems, with no problem, maybe by relating the vision to Abram and Sarai that she had in the wilderness. The son Ishmael is born, and Abram is noted as being 86 years old when Abram, uh, when Ishmael is born. So there's some interesting language about Ishmael. It says he will be a, a kind of bringer of violence and conflict. His hand will always be set against his kinsmen. And Ishmael's descendants are going to be the Arab nations. That's the whole premise of the Quran is that all the Arab nations are descended from Ishmael and from Abram. So the tensions between the Arab nations we see today and the Jewish nation of Israel, it's a very, very ancient kind of conflict. And many people point to this kind of mysterious language that we see here uh, about Ishmael that, that may be kind of manifest in his descendants. Now, We jump from this mini fall with Hagar to the next section of text, and it's 13 years. So Abram now is noted to be 99 years old. That would make Sarai 89 years old. And what happened during these 13 years? Were they on probation? Well, the Jewish rabbis say that God was deliberately silent. He was so wounded by this act of rebellion that he doesn't speak to Abram for 13 years. But here's what God says when he comes back. I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. Remember, Noah was righteous and blameless in his own nature and by choice. Abram has to be commanded to walk blamelessly before the Lord, just like we do. But what does God do? He is so patient and he comes back to Abram and he reaffirms his promises to Abram. Those promises, remember, that go all the way back to Genesis chapter 12. Remember the Abrahamic covenant. We saw the land promise reaffirmed in Genesis 15 around verse 8. Uh, Here we see the kingdom promises that are going to be fulfilled in the person of David and, of course, later Jesus in the kingdom that is the church. That happens here in Genesis 17. And it's also here that God changes Abram's name. So that's usually a sign in scriptures of a new beginning. So we've had 13 years of silence. God is coming back to Abram now. 
He says, let's start over. Let's have a new beginning. There's a new possibility here. There's a new place of favor for you or blessing. And this, of course, will happen later with Jacob, whose name is changed to Israel. Think of Simon being renamed Peter by Christ or Saul taking the name of Paul. They all mark transitions of blessing. So Abram, whose name ironically means exalted father, and yet he was without children, is now changed to Abraham. And Abraham means he will be father of a multitude, or some would translate it, a father of many nations. Later in this chapter, Sarai's name is going to be changed to Sarah. Both of those names are variants of royalty. Uh, some would say that Sarai means princess, but the language around uh, her name changed to Sarah uh, indicates she will become, she's like a queen now, and she's going to be the mother to many kings who will come through her lineage. Now, it's also in this chapter, because we're moving from the promises of chapter 12 to covenant enactments, just like we saw in Genesis 15 with the self-maledictory oath, we're going to have a covenant here. And as I said earlier, covenant literally means, barit means to cut. So we saw the cutting of the sacrificial animals in the self-maledictory oath. And here, God is introducing a new sign of covenant relationship. Earlier covenant signs we've seen in Genesis in, with Adam and Eve, Sabbath becomes the covenant sign for that one couple. Noah, it's the, the bow that is set in the heavens. But here God is going to make this covenant, this cutting, very personal, very memorable. It's the command to be circumcised. And circumcision is also a self-maledictory oath. Look at verse 14. Any uncircumcised male shall be cut off or discarded, just like you would do with the foreskin. So that becomes a symbol. If you break covenant, you will be cut off and discarded. And maybe uh, it's even a fitting location on the body because this is a promise of progeny. This is a promise of children. So to connect the covenant with the reproductive organ really fits within the narrative. Abraham now, of course, is commanded to circumcise himself. Don't ask me how that works. Some mysteries of the Bible I just don't want to explore. Then he, sacri then he circumcises Ishmael, who is how old now? If Abram is 99 years old, Ishmael is 13 years old. That's why many Muslim countries who trace their lineages back to Ishmael circumcise their sons at age 13. Now that doesn't happen everywhere in the world, but it happens in uh, largely Muslim countries like Malaysia, even today. So here you have a 99 year old man with a flint knife circumcising over 300 men in his entourage. And I, <laughs> I don't want to think any, about anyone approaching me with a flint knife, but a 99 year old, let's pray that he didn't have Parkinson's because he's got quite a task ahead of him. But he initiates his entire party into this covenant sign. Carved into the body is this covenant relationship with God. Now I want to close by reflecting on circumcision and the Christian. All the Old Testament covenants, of course, are foreshadowings, are preludes to the Christian sacraments. What new covenant sacrament does circumcision foreshadow? Well, it's baptism. Both circumcision and baptism initiate the person into a covenant relationship with God. How old are most, even Jesus, when they receive circumcision? They're eight days old. When do we typically baptize infants into the new covenant sacrament? When they're infants. Infants. What is that emphasizing in both cases? That faith, that relationship with God is a pure gift of grace. A baby being circumcised is initiated in the covenant relationship with Jesus before they're even conscious of what faith is. That is pure grace. It cannot be earned. It cannot be merited. And so that same faith, that pure gift of grace, is given to us at baptism. And what's so beautiful about baptism is it's universally shared. It's not just a mark in the male body, but all of us enter into this sacrament of the new and everlasting covenant. 
And you know at baptism, they ask the question, what do you seek from the church? And we say baptism and we say faith. And all the parties present there, the parents and the godparents, make a public commitment to cultivate and grow that gift of faith, which has just been given as a pure gift of grace to that child. Think about the New Testament controversy uh, that we see in Acts of the Apostles. What do we do with Gentiles? Should they be circumcised? The Jews of the time of Jesus are trapped in the type and they can't embrace the fulfillment that has come, that baptism is sufficiently ushering them into covenant relationship with God. And Paul, of course, speaks about this in his letter to the Romans, that circumcision isn't an outward and physical thing, but you can become spiritually an heir of Abraham if you are circumcised in your heart by the spirit, not by the written code. And we know the prophets speak this. We'll probably hear this during Lent. Jeremiah says, circumcise yourselves to the Lord. Remove the foreskins around your heart. Cut off yourself from this thing that's preventing you from fully entering into covenant relationship with the Lord. These are powerful chapters. Gosh, there's so much here. Next week, we're going to be exploring the next part of Abraham's story that's going to include the the birth of Isaac and the kind of closing out of that narrative. So I look forward to continue to share this study of Genesis with you. Thank you for your patience that it's not possible right now for me to be live uh, this week again. But please reach out to me if you have any questions or thoughts or insights that we can share with a larger group. God bless you. And may we always close with the benediction of St. Jerome. Read often, learn all that you can, and when sleep overcomes you, may the scripture still be in your hands, and when your head falls, let it be on the sacred page.